The numbers are shameful. At least one in three women and one in four men nationwide experience violence from their partners during their lifetime. On a typical day, domestic violence hotlines receive 21,000 calls for help, or about 15 calls every minute. Hawaii domestic violence programs serve more than 500 people per day. Why is this problem so prevalent? How do we stop it? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Lari Amada. Well, domestic violence, domestic abuse, dating violence, intimate partner abuse, many names for a problem society just can't seem to conquer. Each year in this country, up to 2 million women are victimized, but also as many as 800,000 men. So what can or has to be done to stop it? Is it more education, more awareness, counseling, punishment, some combination? Tonight's guests include a longtime advocate for ending family violence in Hawaii, a consultant for law enforcement, a state lawmaker, and a domestic violence survivor. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can call, email, or tweet your questions, and you're also going to find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to our guests. Nancy Creedman is the co-founder of the Domestic Violence Action Center. She's been involved in local and national efforts to address family violence issues for more than 35 years. Scott Kessler is a consultant with the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office who was previously recognized for his effort to hold abusers in New York City accountable for their crimes. State Representative Linda Ichiyama is from District 32, which includes Moanaloa Valley, Salt Lake, and Aliamanu on Oahu. She has introduced numerous bills this session to address domestic violence. Anne Malia, not using her last name, a single mother of two, an entrepreneur, a business owner, and a survivor of domestic violence. All right, first off, I want to show a couple of numbers here that we're going to show throughout the evening tonight. These are domestic violence helpline numbers for you. One, you can see on the screen there, we're going to show them a few times. We have a number for Oahu that is 808-531-3771 and toll-free 1-800-690-6200. Again, numbers for the domestic violence helpline on Oahu and also toll-free. All right, to our guests, again, thank you all of you for being here this evening. This is such a difficult subject that we as a society here and elsewhere across the globe mm -hmm. have struggled with for, for as long as we can remember. So why? So let's kind of get into, um, maybe we'll start with you, Nancy. Talk a little bit about some of the numbers. Um, what are some of the statistics that you can talk about that we're seeing today? Well, uh, statistics are very interesting. They tell a story, but they don't tell the whole story, since domestic violence is a largely underreported crime. And here locally, we don't do a very good job of capturing the data. So I don't think we have clear understanding of how large uh, a challenge we're facing. Um, we know that we're busy at the Domestic Violence Action Center and the other domestic violence programs on Oahu and statewide responding to calls, inquiries, needs of children and uh, survivors and uh, abusers. Um, at the Domestic Violence Action Center, we help probably 5,000 uh, people a year through all of our programs. We have about 55 people on staff uh, working to address uh, the long and transformative journey of being a victim to becoming a survivor. So we have a legal team that uh, just this past, um, I've got six months data, our um, attorneys who practice in family court made 107 court appearances from July 1 to December 31. So these are our six month numbers. Um, our on-site court program, which is designed to provide information, safety planning, crisis support, for everyone who is getting a temporary restraining order. They uh, supported 1,959 survivors uh, at our um, family court in Kapolei, Punchbowl, and um, District Court. Uh, so they're both on the civil calendar and the criminal calendar. 
So it's a, it's a large problem. It's one that is uh, crucial for us to continue talking about as a community. Um, it's not gone away, as you've uh, eloquently pointed out, and it bears uh, repeating. These messages bear repeating so that we can let uh, survivors know um, that we're here to help and that there are resources in our communities to provide help. And we're looking for um, allies in the community. Uh, we <coughs> see all sectors having the potential to play a role. Uh, we can't do this alone at the Domestic Violence Action Center. Clergy, medical professionals, attorneys, corrections officers, teachers, counselors, lawyers. I mean, there's a role for everyone. And if employers, businesses, um, if we could get everybody to use the same language and um, make it um, some kind of a priority. I mean, it's obviously not going to be everybody's priority. And no doubt we're going to kind of slice into that yeah. as, as the conversation goes on. Yeah. So, um, Rep Representative Uchiyama, I mean, you've been with the um, Women's Legislative Caucus for, for several years now. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know we're going to get into some of the, um, um, the work that you're doing, the bills that are being forth, the efforts that's been, that has been made. Um, but just with the people you've talked to, for you personally, and, and the motivation that um, you have um, to be a part of this and to try to change what's happening, <clears throat> what makes it personal for you? What, what, what really motivates you? So I'm, I'm very fortunate to be one of the co-conveners of the Women's Legislative Caucus. We're a bipartisan organization of women uh, legislators in both the House and the Senate. Um, and I think for me personally, I had always known domestic violence was an issue in our community, um, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago when the Women's Legislative Caucus went on a listening tour, the first time we'd ever done it statewide. And it was a partnership with the judiciary um, as well as it was with the Attorney General's office. And what we did in every county was we started with survivors telling their stories and their experiences. And um, <clears throat> I uh, heard firsthand how terrifying it is to be in this situation. And even more terrifying to be let down by the systems that are supposed to protect you. And the failure on our part as government agencies to provide the safety net that survivors need in order to escape these relationships and these situations, um, that for me was particularly striking. And I know for a lot of the attendees, they heard of how our systems have re-traumatized mm -hmm. victims when they seek help. So for me, that was especially, um, especially poignant. Now, Scott, I want to get to you in just a few minutes because um, you, you've got an interesting perspective based on the, the long um, history of work that you've done in New York and areas in the mainland and then coming here and um, um, doing the same in many ways. But first, I want, I want to talk to you, Malia. Um, this has been quite a journey for you. Yes. And I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I want you to share um, why you're here, what brought you to this point. Honestly, I think um, I was brought to this point by acts of God. Like, if I didn't get, if I got the help that I needed, I wouldn't be a voice in the community. I wouldn't be an advocate for domestic violence. Um, the system did let me down. I was with a federal firefighter and um, had suffered a head injury as well as a hip injury and a minor concussion. Uh, and just unfortunately, the first responders were friends of his. Um, you know, he didn't render aid, broke my phone, I had no communication. Um, and I really believe that that just motivates me to get out here and, and try to help make some changes in Hawaii. I want to show a few pictures, and I want to let our viewer, viewers know that these pictures are, are pretty disturbing, um, but they're part of your reality. Absolutely. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and show some of these pictures and just tell us a little bit more what you want to share as we... Um, that's the hip injury. I actually was flipped um, onto the concrete sidewalk outside of his home, um, and he stood over me bent over and, and bashed my head into the cement. 
um, so the, the left top corner of my head, um, uh, I don't know how to look at that picture. Is that tough for you? Yeah. Yeah. And I was just let down by the system. First responders initially, um, and then taking this to the prosecutor's office and and, and trying to pursue my case as much as, and as hard it, and difficult as it was at the time, knowing that financially, emotionally, being a single mom of two children was the tr transition I needed to make. And with no support, it, it literally put me in a spot of the reality of growing up and, and being told that these people are here to help you you can run to them, They're, they'll always protect you. It, it was just a complete shock for me. And it was drawn out for, until now, you know. Um, I've done everything I possibly could to try to reopen this case. And even with the current situation with the prosecutors and what's going on in the office now, there's no way that my case can be reopened is what I was told. And I feel that's very unfair. Um, and I can only imagine how many people, how many women, how many men are going through the same thing. So Scott, you came here um, to work with the prosecutor's office. Tell us first a little bit more about I mean, extensive work um, that you've done uh, in New York. And, and I mean, the stories, all of you, uh, but you as well, have heard. And when you listen to Malia talk, what goes through your mind? Sure. I mean, I was a prosecutor in New York City for 30 years. I was the former bureau chief of the Domestic Violence Bureau in Queens County for the last 22 years. Um, and, you know, we handled roughly about 5,000 domestic violence arrests in my county each year. Um, and they ranged from simple pushing and shoving to murder. Um, you know, one, one of the key parts of, you know, our role as prosecutors is try to hold the batterer accountable for his actions and keep victims safe. Uh, I think that's the goal, uh, and so when um, I left the DA's office there and uh, became uh, hired here by uh, Honolulu, um, you know, I met with the prosecutor and said, you know, I wanted to talk to them a little bit about what role they thought I would help in. And so from the beginning, you know, um, I, I think it's important that everyone understand holding batters accountable is a difficult task here in Hawaii. I mean, a vast majority of these cases are getting dismissed, and it is due to pretty much a system where the batterers are controlling the victim, and the victim's controlling the prosecution and the case, and in reality, the batterer is controlling the outcome. And so if he can control whether or not the victim appears or doesn't appear at trial, mm -hmm. and by being able to control that, he's controlling the total outcome of the case, so he's never held accountable if it's a man. And what ends up happening is a matter of two adjournments, the whole case is dismissed, and it appears as if he was never arrested, and it appears she will uh, never seek any type of relief in connection with the next time it gets battered because what's going to happen is it's going to empower him for the next occasion. And it may be the same woman, and it may be a different woman if, if it's a man. Um, so, you know, my role from the beginning was to try and, you know, encourage the fact that, you know, I've always believed that while defendants have a lot of rights, the victims have some rights too, and especially on domestic violence. They have a right to be safe in their home. They have a right while the defendant is arrested not to be harassed or threatened or coerced. They have the right, you know, during the pendency of the case to not be arrested for being a victim of domestic violence in order to try and arrest her, to force her to testify. And at the same time, you know, at the end, I think, uh, she has the right to be assured that her case will be held seriously, looked into, and done everything possible under the law. So it's, it's a lot going on. Um, and so I'm just getting started. I began in August. And I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about that, but I see, uh, Malia, you nodding your head here. What are some other moments that stand out to you as you entered into the legal process that were particularly difficult? I think knowing that I'm the fifth girlfriend that had been put in the, hosp in the hospital and, and just, it's a repeat offender that has been enabled by the system. No repercussions whatsoever. 
and it's gonna continue. And now the generational trauma, is that gonna be passed on to my son? Absolutely not. And I fought that in family court, and I don't think they did too well of a job to kind of manage that. Um, it, 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 when does the cycle end? When does this, and I think a lot of this has to be mental health. And, and for him to at one point want to turn himself in and being told by HPD that, oh, no, we can't arrest you yet. He was on scene. They let him walk away with my head looking like that. With my, I was, I, I could barely fo focus, you know. So this is really, I think, a question for both of you as far as the actions that you're taking, have taken, are taking, try to take. When you hear um, someone like Malia talk about what she experienced, not only the abuse, but then going through the process to try um, to move past that. Um, at this point in time, what, what stands out to you? I know there's a lot of things you could talk about. Well, what stands out for me is the importance of conversations like this and the importance of conversations throughout the community with our system allies so that uh, we can huddle, if you will, around what are the best uh, steps to take to prevent uh, Malia from suffering uh, further and to make sure that the system is responsive and supportive and effective in um, making her pathway forward a safe one and his accountability uh, pronounced. So we sit on a lot of committees, we do a lot of technical assistance, we try to, we respond to every invitation to speak because the more people who speak about the uh, problem and name it, the more likely we are to have um, uh, useful uh, conversations. About so Representative Ichiyama, let's talk about some specifics on some of the um, legislative that you, uh, legislation that you're working on now and why um, you're choosing to um, pinpoint those particular parts of the law. Sure, so there are a couple of bills in this year's Women's Legislative Caucus package that deal with domestic violence specifically. Mm -hmm. um, two of them have to do with the temporary restraining order process, which is usually the first step that a victim will seek um, in order to get away from her abuser. Um, one of the bills would uh, prohibit continuances of the hearing after the TRO is granted. So after the TRO is granted by a judge, it's served on the defendant, and then both parties have to appear before the judge in a hearing, and then they dis the court decides whether or not to issue a protective order permanently. What's happening is that you have um, uh, defendants gaming the system by asking for continuance after continuance, and the victim has to show up each time in court, sometimes waiting for half a day, a whole day, only to find out the hearing's been continued, and that means that she has to take out time from work, find somebody to take care of her kids, find transportation to get there. Um, and uh, so we are um, trying to stop that practice with a bill that would prohibit continuances without some showing of good cause. Um, and so we're putting it on the judge to say, this is the reason why we're continuing it and not just granting X number of continuances. Um, another bill would um, um, seal uh, TRO applications that have been denied. And this is because sometimes abusers use TROs as a means of retaliation. Mm -hmm. And even if the TRO, the retaliatory TRO is denied, it still remains on a victim's record. Mm -hmm. So when she goes to apply for a new job or housing, if anybody does a court search on her name, they'll find out that somebody applied for a TRO against her. And then she is going to have struggle to get those other opportunities. Um, I want to talk about one other bill that specifically kind of talks about what Scott and Malia address, which is the breakdown in our criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Um, so the TRO is a civil procedure. Uh, the criminal justice system is, is different, and Oahu especially, because of a large number of backlogs. Um, so we had a city audit report a couple years ago that looked at the number of cases, domestic violent cases, that were dismissed because of the speedy trial rule. So the lack of a speedy trial means that if you do not have a trial against a defendant within a certain number of days, the charges get dropped. And because of the backlog that we have in our court system, cases were getting dropped. How often do you see that in states? Is that unusual? Is that common? Uh, this Hawaiian system is one of the most draconian I've ever seen. The really? charging, 
prosecutors for time, even though the court's adjourning it. Um, limiting the amount of to a six-month period of time uh, where there's continuances, you know, uh, all the time. Small amount of court space. The fact they only have two trials parts going at the same time. So I, I think, uh, you know, in comparison to other states, uh, their speedy trial laws, especially for domestic violence cases, don't make a lot of sense. I'm not sure, you know, it, the idea is to try to move things quickly, but it's doing the opposite effect. It's just dismissing more and more cases mm -hmm. because no one can move the cases fast enough. So you um, you testified recently and, and uh, sort of gave the highlights, really, of some of the things that stood out to you that um, you felt really needed to be changed or at least had the potential to be changed and why weren't they being changed. Uh, give, give us some examples of some of the things that, that you talked about. I mean, you know, in terms of changes, I, I, I think the, the amount of effort it takes for a victim in Hawaii to get a restraining order is unbelievable. I mean, we make it as hard as possible for the victims to get the restraining order. Uh, you know, in New York, we tried to make it as easy as possible by having locations where they could actually apply for a restraining order via uh, television. So the judge can see the victim, they, she could be at a shelter, she could be at a safe location, and there's no reason the victim has to show up and they're limited amount, of, they have to be at family court at a certain amount of time. They're only hearing a certain number of cases. They may have to go back if they need the restraining order the same day. So we make it really difficult for victims to come down and get restraining orders. You know, uh, technology. You know, I think is one of the reasons that I'm um, trying to work now on getting technology easier. In, in, there's no reason a victim should not get an order of protection electronically. Okay, we have emails, we have cell phones. Uh, once we get that order, you know, I'm, I'm pushing the idea now that let's get it to that victim so she has it immediately. She shouldn't have to wait in the mail for it. She shouldn't have to wait for the batter to get it by himself. Um, we should make it as easy as possible for them to get the order and hang on to the order. They shouldn't have to carry a paper around with them at all times. The police should also get that order electronically so they know exactly who has an order protection in their district. So if someone violates that order, there shouldn't be a guessing game is, is there an order? Do you have one? We don't have it. Where's yours? Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think using technology uh, to can really improve the way that victims are treated in both the court system and getting orders of protection. So let me so get I to just want to say this is yeah, sure, our, the system that we currently have is vastly improved <laughs> over the uh, uh, many years of effort trying to do exactly what you're suggesting, that we make it more streamlined and more easy and more accessible for people. It used to be you had to make an appointment and then you'd have to go down there. Now you can just show up. I mean, there's a, a bunch of ways. It, but it's moving a big machine to make significant changes. Supposedly, you can uh, electronically transmit the order once it's issued to the police for them to serve it, rather than it used to be she had to take it to the district in where he lived so that they could serve it. Now, uh, supposedly, it's electronically transmitted. Okay, let me get to a few questions here. Um, and I think this touched on something that um, Leah said earlier from Anon. How much of domestic violence is caused by, say, drugs, financial frustration? You mentioned um, a mental state. Um, that I think that might be an obvious one, but uh, or, or a mental illness of some kind. Uh, how much of this would you say? I, I mean, I guess there's some, I'm sure, combination of a lot of this, as far as. How, how you can determine what, what might be sort of leading to this, or do you well, have that information? Well, we don't see uh, these as contributing causes of domestic violence. Uh, they might exacerbate domestic violence, but um, there are many abusers who don't drink at all or use any drugs and still perpetuate, uh, perpetrate domestic violence against their partners. Uh, they may, may be middle class or upper middle class, so there's no financial uh, difficulty. So some of these are misconceptions that we uh, cling to as a community um, because looking at it, uh, naming it, is, is, is difficult. And you know what, you're leading actually to um, something we want to share. We have a couple of PSAs that I think uh, uh, lend to your point. In, um, and, and one of the questions I had on here was, what are the most recognizable signs of domestic violence? And I think we, we, we are in a society today um, where you, ju you just can't put a, a label on it the way that maybe we thought we could. Um, so I think we have some videos. Um, let's go ahead and show one of those PSAs. So why do you love your wife? Why do I love my wife? Um, she's beautiful, obviously. <laughs> she's smart, way smarter than me, but don't tell her I said that. I love that she spends time with me. 
Uh, she could go out with her friends or sisters, but if I asked her to stay in, she always does. I trust her, like with money. I tell her here's what she can spend, and she never goes a penny over. And she trusts me, too, and take her clothes. She only wears what I want her to. But what I mainly love is that she respects me. What can I say? I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Okay, I want to get your response. <laughs> Who wants to jump in? I, I think I agree with Nancy's response in terms of, you know, I've seen thousands of batterers, you know, over the last 30 years, and they come in every race, creed, color, economic background, job. There are plenty of people who drink who don't end up beating their wives. Mm -hmm. And so to say and blame it that it must be the alcohol, you know, uh, it, it reminds when I did sex crimes cases, people would claim they were drunk and that's why they sexually abused somebody. And, you know, uh, I think this is all about power and control. And a lot of these cases are about jealous rage where people just become enraged and, you know, they're not beating their boss because their boss may report them, they may be held accountable, they may strike back. They're choosing, like a bully, to pick someone they believe is weaker f physically and they choose somebody who they think they can control. And that's exactly why the assault happens and that's exactly why, you know, when they get to court, their only out is to convince her not to appear. It's not as if, you know, they're coming in saying there's some mental illness I have. Their defense is, you don't show up to court, I won't be held accountable. They come in, and by the second court date, they usually leave with a smirk on their face, thinking I just got away with it. I gotta ask you your response, Malia. I completely agree. Um, I, where I think this comes from is some kind of childhood trauma, and and if we can address that and work on the mental state of these, it's hard, right? I mean, like you said, the abuser's not gonna admit to it, especially if they've been enabled by the system. Why would they? Why would they want to get help? So I'm, I'm going to challenge uh, that a little bit. Um, I think we socialize little boys to become uh, abusers and bullies. Uh, we condition little boys to be in charge, to be brave, tough, and strong and in charge. Mm -hmm. And we teach little girls, still today, I mean, as modern as we think we are, um, we teach little girls to be um, nurturing, caregiving, uh, accommodating. This is a recipe for domestic violence. Uh, when people are experimenting with intimacy or living in intimate relationships, um, he's in charge and she's not. It really doesn't have anything to do with a, a mental state. Um, trauma is a huge variable, and trauma also exacerbates it. If you're a child living in a home, it does cause trauma. If you're a survivor, it certainly is traumatizing, um, but it isn't quite so much about the mental state. So, um, boy, you um, are speaking to Lloyd from Kahala. He is saying, is there anything being done in our education system to teach young people, oftentimes boys, how reprehensible our society considers domestic violence? Not enough, no. We have not made a commitment as a community to address uh, children or young people and help uh, prevent uh, the eventual uh, perpetration of uh, power and control. Um, we need to make a big investment if uh, that's what we you know, decide is a priority for us in order to inter interrupt the, the cycle of violence. But we haven't quite done that yet. So here's a question from uh, Michael from Kaka'ago. He said, is, why is there not, uh, maybe there is, I don't know, why is there not a special division of law enforcement just to enforce domestic violence laws? Is there one? Have you heard of that anywhere else or any semblance of that? Um, yeah, in, in New York City, there's domestic violence officers assigned to every mm -hmm. precinct, and they're assigned to handle the domestic violence in each but of. But that's not something you've heard of here. No, we don't have that here. Right, and what's good about it, from my point of view, is, that, and if I had an issue in a particular mm -hmm. precinct, and I knew there was a number of individuals who were the worst of domestic violence offenders, I would meet with the captains and the domestic violence officers and say, here's our top offenders, here's the people we need to focus on because this is in becoming an issue where each of the times the violence is getting bigger, mm -hmm. stronger, and more severe. And if we don't stop it now, okay, we're gonna end up with a homicide. If you look at the 2017 audit uh, that you spoke of, almost 40% of your homicides were domestic violence homicides in this state. 
that's an enormous number. The audit also indicated somewhere in the range that a lot of your violent felonies are domestic violence related. So having domestic violence officers who were responsible for making sure that they had orders of protection in effect, they were responsible for making sure that they would keep in contact with victims. In New York, our officers would do follow-ups on the domestic violence cases. So if you were a uh, defendant was arrested on a domestic violence case, two or three days later, our officers would check on the victim, let them know who the prosecutor was the connection with the case, do follow-up photos, make sure we got text messages if the defendant was violating the order of protection. If the defendant was there, we would immediately arrest them. So by f making this a priority you know, for uh, the county, we were able to immediately s try to stem our domestic violence homicides and was able to bring down our domestic violence homicides by getting a focus on the cases even before they became a homicide. Because every one of these cases is a potential domestic violence homicide. I heard you make a comment. That would be absolutely amazing for what he could adapt to that. Um, and being that these officers are trained and know the, that being hysterical isn't something you condescend a victim in your report and, and, and basically discredit them because they're hysterical or they're crying or they're emotional. I think that's a great concept. So that's something that Jean from Waikiki brought up too, saying um, she thinks that all judges, judges and police officers should take a course on domestic violence at least annually. Is there something judges offered? Judges, judges do. Judges participate in quite a bit of training. What, what Judiciary has made a big commitment to training judges. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, annually they have a three-day symposium on domestic violence and all judges participate in it. Um, they send uh, individual judges to the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court judges for specialized training on How long violence. has that been going on? Quite, quite, a, quite a few mm -hmm. years. I would say at least 10 or more years. Okay. Um, it doesn't always trickle down into the courtroom, but um, systems are made up of people. So even though the system has made a commitment to it, sometimes individuals bring their own personal experience or their own implicit bias or their own expectations, and sometimes that interferes, clearly. I would just add on to what Nancy was saying, though. When we went on the statewide tour, one of the gaps that we found in that training was that per diem judges, right. which are um, like temporary judges to fill in when um, they have uh, Did not. too many cases, do not receive that level of training. Um, and many times they are the ones sitting in on domestic violence cases. And so that's something that we ask the judiciary to make an effort to make sure that the per diem judges receive the same level of, or close to the same level of training mm -hmm. as the regular judges. So what else needs to happen for that training to trickle down to other areas that are part of that legal process? Or what efforts have you seen? Well, it would be good if our um, police uh, had more training. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've been in conversation with the police department about the importance of training and when uh, experts and others who've worked in other jurisdictions come and visit Hawaii and um, train us, uh, they talk about the importance. Um, again, if we're going to be a system working together, everybody kind of has to be sufficiently trained so that we can advance the needle, move the needle, the way Scott's talking about. So you've uh, been working with the prosecutor's office for a while, and no doubt talking about some of these scenarios. Right. Uh, what, what are you hearing as to either why more of that training hasn't happened or what it might take for it to happen? You're talking about the police training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, the way diff the difficulty about training a number of officers is trying to get them all in one location and having them at, at, at one time where you have everyone listening to the same thing over and over. So what we found was, um, the way we did training in my jurisdiction was each of your officers had a cell phone, right? So it was a police-issued cell phone because we didn't want them taking photographs on their own personal phones. So not only did they need a police-issued cell phone, but on that cell phone, when they took a picture, it automatically was uploaded to the prosecutor's office. So we, when the photo was taken, it immediately appeared on the prosecutor's desk. So we were able to use that photograph for arguments regarding orders of protection and bail. Mm -hmm. So that combination also allowed us, once they had that court-issued phone, to me to do a training on the phone with like a podcast, almost a video, like a YouTube style. So if I did a strangulation training where I needed officers to take better pictures, let's say, of the back of the victim's neck, because they weren't taking enough pictures of the back of the victim's neck, then I would be, uh, 
brought into a studio like this, done a training. I could take that video out to 30,000 police officers, and I'd also know which ones saw it and which ones didn't because we have control over that cell phone. So by issuing police officers their own cell phones and not only having that but requiring them to take photographs of the victim on the scene, photographs of broken door locks. Right. We want uh, pictures of broken furniture. In addition, text messages. Uh, one of the things we uh, brought about was a lot of times uh, there's two kinds of domestic violence cases. One's where the batterer stays on the scene and one's where they leave. The ones where they leave are the, some of the most dangerous cases because now they're just waiting for the police to leave before they return. So what we were able to do on those cases is work with the police so that when they were at the scene and they interviewed the victim, we wanted them to take a picture of the batterer so they had that for the police records. So we would ask the victim, do you have a picture of this person? And they would say, yes, it's on my phone. They would take a picture of that. So every time the police officers responded, they know who they were dealing with. The guy couldn't pretend he was the cousin. When they walked in the door, it was much safer for police officers to respond to domestic violence incidents because now they had a photograph of the defendant. So simple things like that uh, where you, you just set up uh, technology so that you're able to train a number of officers all at the same time. At the same time, use the technology to assist the prosecution on the case. We require them to take text message pictures as well because now people don't call anymore or leave a message on the machine. <laughs> so we'd have text messages. In addition, we'd have follow-up photos because oftentimes bruises won't appear right as they responded. If they banged their leg, if they had a bruise, if they were thrown into a wall, at the scene, they took a picture, but there was nothing That's shown. Right. Yeah. But the officers came back two days later, and with those pictures, all of a sudden it became black and blue. So just by working with the police departments, working with the officers, all with the same goal of trying to keep the victims safe and holding the batters accountable, and just trying to use technology. And that's what I'm doing now is when I'm, you know, dealing with the prosecuting attorney, you know, Dwight Natamoto, and I'm talking to him about what we need to get done. Uh, a lot of it involves just retraining and using some technology that's currently not in effect, but not that much money. If cell phones are not that expensive these days. The, the legislation that you put forth um, uh, this session, how, how's that going? What is the response you're getting? How's that? So all of the bills that we've introduced regarding domestic violence in some form, either a Senate bill or a House bill, are still alive. And so that's very positive to see. I think that there is growing awareness amongst our colleagues about the pervasiveness of domestic violence. Um, it's also gratifying to see that um, several of my male colleagues have introduced their own domestic violence measures. Really? Yes, as not a part of the Women's Caucus package. Nancy remembers the days when <laughs> all the domestic violence bills were in the Women's Caucus package and that was it. Um, so it's refreshing to see that. Yeah, I think, I think it's important that uh, you know, this, you know, it's funny, in, in where I'm from, I'm, it's, it's, it may be a Women's Caucus, but I'm not familiar with it, but most of the domestic violence uh, bills we're coming from male legislators, and the way it's viewed is it's not really a woman's issue, it's you know, a human rights issue. And so it shouldn't be just women that are right. introducing bills that have involving domestic violence, it affects a lot more than just women in connection with it. A lot of the, you know, their daughters, their friends, their colleagues. So I just think by labeling it a woman's issue, it really is not appropriate. It's a human rights issue, and everyone should be involved. You know, we had a number of bills, and I've looked at the, a great year for you know, the legislative bills, but I was surprised at the lack of a number of people who could comment on it and didn't. You know, because mm -hmm. you, you pretty much easily can comment on any bill by uh, clicking on an internet site and writing in whether or not you support or not support it the bill. It made it very, very easy. It made it really easy, but there's so many people who I was surprised never said a word. And it doesn't take more than a minute, yeah. you know. And, you know, one of the bills that we're pushing is this uh, hearsay exception, 2610, that was introduced. And we've been, uh, I've been testifying in, in the judiciary uh, hearing, I've been testifying in front of the House, I testified in, in the finance, it, um, it's now moved to Ways and Means. But these kinds of bills are so vitally important that it would allow, you know, a, a sort of exceptions on domestic violence cases for hearsay so that we could start proving cases without the victim's cooperation. Mm -hmm. And we could talk more about that. But those type of bills, I think, would be so important. And I was expecting a lot more support from just every, everyone who could possibly support these kind of bills. So maybe it's a lack of knowledge. Uh, maybe it's uh, just too busy. Um, but these are, I think this legislative session, these bills are probably some of the most important bills you can find in the state of Hawaii right now. So he is singing my song. <laughs> we want people to comment and give us feedback on bills, and we want to work with stakeholders and community partners, so absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's so easy to go on the Capitol website, 
just keyword search mm -hmm. domestic violence and a whole bunch of bills will pop right up. Yeah. And each Here's of them will have be commented on, like when I was in the uh, Senate and anyone who even wrote in, no matter who they were, that comment would be read into the record. Mm -hmm. uh, and just sometimes it was just citizens who wrote in saying how important this bill is and what it would mean to them. As far as choosing some of the legislation that you're focusing on, here's a question from um, an individual in Maui. How do you, how do legislators balance protection for victims with the legal rights of the accused? Um, that's always a, I would imagine, when it comes down to it, a fine line to walk. That's yes. a Scott question. <laughs> I think that's go ahead. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Sure. You can start out. Um, so we um, work very closely with the um, Women's Coalition, which is a group of advocates for women's issues. But we also work very closely with our partners in the law enforcement side. So we don't want to put forward a bill that would be unconstitutional or a bill that would, um, you know, let uh, perpetrators off the hook. So we work very closely with the prosecutor's office, as well as the Office of the Public Defender and our own Office of the Attorney General to make sure that these issues are vetted before we pass legislation. Yeah, I, I think it's important. The last thing you want as a prosecutor is to get a conviction in connection with a bill and a case or a statute and then get it reversed uh, yeah. on appeal. So that's why, you know, the bill I worked on, uh, 2610, you know, I we were thrilled that the Attorney General uh, agreed with, it originally came out in one form. and. Um, the problem was when the way it came out, it would have been ruled unconstitutional. And I got a chance to look at it and did some research and uh, had an appeals assistant work with me. And we just worked over the bill and figured out how we can change this so that it has this balance where we still give the defendant a right to a fair trial, but also victims the right to be protected in their home because they have that right as well. And to try to find that balance, I think we were able to find it by just changing a few things in the bill, giving defendants a little bit more rights than they currently have in the state of Oregon because we were using an Oregon statute and trying to mirror it here, but I found the Oregon statute would have gone too far and would have, would have been reversed. But um, it's that balance and, you know, victims have rights as well to be safe in their home and they have a right for government to try and protect them, you know, and balancing the defendant's right to a fair trial. And I think a lot of these bills are often looked at uh, by a number of sources and people and no one wants a bill that's going to be deemed unconstitutional. But um, th there's no question. Uh, defendants' rights are vitally important, and uh, I think when you look at the bills, uh, I don't think you'll find that anything is unconstitutional in connection with them. Um, a lot of them clarify things, a lot of them are enhancements, a lot of them are things that just are slipping through the system that currently needs to be corrected. Well, if you think of every step of the way, every part of the process that um, a victim, their family has to go through, every little incremental change right. could make a huge difference or be Absolutely. the difference. Uh, what what helped you get over your fear with everything that you went through um, to push through this process, knowing the challenges, knowing how difficult it was and frustrating? What helped you push through? I look at my little girl and I, I know there needs to be change here in Hawaii. I have um, so the support of Nancy, Marcy as well. And that's all it takes. It takes a little bit of support, you know, and everybody just needs to be on the same page. And, and don't doubt people. Don't, you know, don't doubt victims. Don't, I can't explain the feeling of just being questioned after all of that because it doesn't end. I'm now going to family court and being abused there through fa trying, you know, trying to get custody of my son. And it's a financial burden, emotional, it's draining, finding a sitter as a single mom, you know, and. For women or men who are watching, um, what, do you want them to take away from what you're saying? What do you think is the most important thing for them to take away? I think you, there's advocates out there. There's people that can help. Um, DVAC and support them. They're financially in a bind right now. And th these are the people that are pushing the laws and pushing the bills. Mm -hmm. That's the change. That's where it starts. Yeah, I want to show the numbers again. Um, 
while you're talking about this. Um, everybody can take a, take a look at that. We have a couple of numbers there for you. Uh, you know, and I think that's it. what I would imagine is, is so tough for a lot of people to get over is, is just asking in the first place. Right. Just asking for help, mm -hmm. feeling empowered enough to do that after everything they've been through. Um, was that a challenge for you? Absolutely. I mean, even the social repercussions, you know, of just being out there. But I know, I know what I'm doing. I know, I know I have to change. I'm very grateful for the support that I do have. Some of the, some of the cards I'm getting here are very long, but I, <laughs> but I, want, I do want to share these. Um, and this is um, from someone who emailed this in. They said something I've never forgotten probably 30, 40 years ago in my early 30s, my high school classmate who was a police officer for about 10 to 20 years said, quote, when we answer calls for domestics, we wonder what the Wahine did deserve to get beat up, end quote. In my mind then as now, quote, totally effed up thinking. I doubt that has changed much um, and that is a concern. When you yes. hear that, it's true. I've been, I've been asked that by a family member. What did you do to him to deserve that? What do you want to tell her? Get help. <laughs> it, it hurts. It hurts to hear that, you know. Um. This is another um, from Richard on Oahu. Caller's daughter on the Big Island was abused by her husband who was waiting trial for the offense. She's not permitted to leave the Big Island to join her parents on Oahu. The reason given is that her husband had visitation rights to the children who are in the mother's custody. So it seems like the wrong party is being punished. Who wants to comment? Uh, we interact, like I said earlier, with many, many, many victims who feel like they are being re-victimized by the system in a variety of ways. Um, and that's a description of one way, that uh, their uh, freedom to make decisions in their best interests um, and possibly for their safety are um, sacrificed um, maybe by a system that doesn't fully understand what the impact of those decisions are. Um, visitation and custody and all the issues around visitation and custody are very complex and requires uh, some very thoughtful application of analysis by judges and um, attorneys and advocates so that uh, children uh, feel supported and survivors feel supported and at the same time we're not denying fathers the right to their children. But there is sort of the old belief that children need both parents and fathers have a right to their children. Well, our view is if you have abused your child's mother and uh, traumatized your child uh, through that abuse, maybe you're not a perfect parent or a good parent and maybe that needs to be revisited or examined more closely. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the laws that are currently in place that have changed in recent years or that may change sometime soon based on uh, people here at the table, their efforts. Um, what do you want to make sure people are aware is in place, can help to protect, that maybe they don't always realize uh, or think to ask? Um, do, do you, do you um, see that in court sometimes, you, where you say, okay, this, this individual doesn't realize that they have this Right. They don't doesn't realize that they have this. They can ask this. That what 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 do you often see? Sort of. Well, the court system is an sure. unfamiliar land, mm -hmm. and when you enter the court system, it is a different uh, vocabulary, and it's a, a system with a lot of rules and uh, procedures that are unfamiliar to the person. So to have somebody standing with you, standing by you, either as an advocate or as an attorney, is an enormous gift. Uh, we don't have enough uh, of those for our community of survivors who seek support and protection from the court system. So we want them to ask questions, but sometimes you don't know what the question is to ask, is kind of your point. 
um, which is why we're on site, for example, at family court to make sure that we are able to talk to every person who's getting a restraining order so they know that they have rights and they know that uh, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bumpy ride and that we'll be with them every step of the way until they get to their uh, safe escape. I would also add that there are a couple of um, laws that we passed in the recently um, to help people who are just trying to figure out the day-to-day -day of how do I separate from this relationship. So for example, there's a law that allows you to end your family cell phone plan. Mm -hmm. So without a termination fee, um, if you can show you're a victim of domestic violence, then the carrier is required to release you from that family plan. Um, if you are in a joint lease agreement with your partner, and you need to find a new place to live. It allows early termination of that lease. Um, so there are a couple things that, you know, real concrete things that people mm -hmm. are like, how do I do this? And the folks at DVAC can help them navigate that. Mm -hmm. Some other things to mention? Uh, I, those, I think one of the misconceptions, on yeah, one of the misconceptions I think uh, that I've noticed since I've been here is the fact that everyone seems to think that the case which is criminal is a civil case because they keep asking what the victim wants. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's like, well, the victim doesn't want an order of protection today, so we're not going to give her an order. The victim doesn't want him to go to jail. The victim, and we don't do that in any other case. We never go to someone who's robbed and say, by the way, what would you like in connection with the <laughs> defendant? What's the punishment you want? Uh, well, I'd like him to serve the rest of his life in prison. And we don't go, okay, we w we'd ask for a life sentence because that's what the victim wants. Or, or someone's car is stolen. I like his hand being slammed into the car door, right? So we, we don't do that. But it seems on domestic violence, it's sort of all motivated here by what the victim wants. If she wants an order, she gets an order, maybe. If she doesn't want an order, she doesn't get an order. But it's not a civil case. You know, I think the problem is it's the people of the state of New York versus the people of the state of Hawaii, I'm sorry, versus uh, the defendant. And, um, you know, if there's an order of protection, it's a court order. Um, you know, I'm surprised at how many victims of domestic violence right now do not have an order of protection. And the defendant is about to go to court for trial, and he's living with the victim. So the two of them are going to court together after having just slept in the same house the day before. It's as if you would have a robbery of a store owner and the judge is ordering the person who's the robber to live with the store owner until the trial date and then expecting that store owner to come in and testify truthfully. What are a few other things maybe that you can point out that, um, that I don't know, maybe, maybe you might be surprised that, that victims typically don't realize they can do? Um, that would be relatively easy, um, that might help them at least in part to separate from their situation. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's so important that victims, when they get to family court and they're looking for a restraining order, have an advocate or an attorney with them. I, I just think they should have that right. They should ask for that in court. The court shouldn't have one side having the uh, defendant have an attorney because he can't afford one and have the victim have no one on their side. And it could be a law student, it could be a, a victim advocate, it, sh it could be you know a, a, a pro bono attorney, but they should have a right to have someone there to help them with their petition, to you know make sure that they go into the courthouse and not have to see the batter. You know, one of the things I'm focusing on and had a meeting with my, advoc my advocates, the advocates, were how many courthouses don't have a safe place for the victims to appear. Mm -hmm. So they have to sit there and watch this guy walk by every single time. It's required under the law that they have a safe place to be and every courthouse should provide a victim a location where, we have some locations I was speaking to people, who are victims are waiting in McDonald's because they feel unsafe in the courthouse. And that should not happen anywhere where they're coming in for an order of protection, have to sit in a McDonald's because they're afraid there's no other place for them. That should be fixed immediately. Malia, what are some other things that through this process that you learned that um, A, if you had only known, but also that you want to make sure that, um, that other victims, other people watching do learn and do know from your experience, what, do you, what did you learn that you think is important to share about getting through the process? I would say have an advocate at your side. Um, I had a pro bono lawyer attorney, but he was actually, um, he was in a different field, I think, or he wasn't, he had nothing to do with family or DV. Were there um, some specific things that, that, um, that you learned that said, hey, I, if I, had, I didn't know that, or I didn't know I could do that? Not really. Wish Nancy, do you remember, recall any of that? I think most people don't realize that there is help right? and That's that the, the help is going to be responsive to their need. Every uh, survivor is a unique individual with, a, with a, a life story that is different from the woman next to her. 
So we try to shape our support to meet her needs, which may be very different from her needs. And that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. We want people to know that um, their uh, experience is real, meaningful, uh, important to us, and important for the well-being of the community. Safe families are at the core of a healthy community. Any other resources that we can talk about, that we can make sure that we share, uh, that people... Yes, Child and Family Service uh, uh, runs uh, some domestic violence programs, um, shelter programs, transitional housing programs, and support groups, and batters intervention uh, programs. Parents and Children Together does also, uh, runs shelters, um, Family Peace Center, uh, domestic violence intervention, which is ordered uh, upon a criminal conviction, victim support groups. Um, so it's it's pretty important. We have a partnership with the University of Hawaii where we provide uh, support for uh, people enrolled in our um, community college and university system. Uh, we have a specialized uh, relationship with the Japanese consulate mm -hmm. and have a Japanese advocate who works with Japanese nationals. There's a lot of uh, depth to what we've developed as a community and in response. I and I know that there's there's more to talk about. All of you here have been just wonderful to have here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Nancy Friedman, co-founder of the Domestic Violence Action Center, State Representative Linda Uchiyama uh, from Wanalua Valley, Salt Lake, and Iliamanu on Oahu. Scott Kessler, thank you. Cons cons consulted, excuse me, with the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office. And Lilia, thank you, a domestic violence survivor. And thank you again for being here and sharing your experiences and helping others as well. Next week on Insights, COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Stay alert, stay informed, stay healthy. Please join us then. I'm Laurie Abad on Insights on PBS Hawaii, Uhuiho.